welcome home. We are WNST, Towson Baltimore. And Baltimore Positive, uh, happily making our way up onto the trading deadline. I got my El Guapo gear out. Uh, we are putting together our next Maryland Crab Cake Tour show across the street from El Guapo. We're going to be at State Fair. We're going to be with uh, maybe future Senator Angela Alsobrooks, uh, current uh, county executive for Prince George's County. Uh, we have invited Larry Hogan on. We hope that he will make it as well. But on the 13th of August, before Mako, I'll be giving these away. The Gold Rush Sevens Doublers from the Maryland Lottery. Our friends from Jiffy Lube Multicare, as well as Liberty Pure Solutions putting us out on the road. We're going to be at Fadley's a little later on in the month when the cheat throws come in here. Uh, they might still be in first place by the time that happens at the end of August. Uh, this guy monitors all things baseball. I know him through baseball. I love him through rock and roll. I appreciate him through the sports business culture of the work he's uh, done at Forbes and in other places. I call him Bizball Mari. He has been a phenomenal host to me in uh, Portlandia, and that's Oregon, not Maine, for those of you out there keeping score at home. Um, he covers all things of uh, the business of sports and is a baseball head and a rock and roller and uh, sort of moonlights, as they would say, uh, in two rock and roll bands, uh, one an ACDC cover band uh, called Shoot the Thrill and a uh, recently played Scorpions a, a, a cover band uh, where he gets to uh, play the role of um, of, uh, uh, of Michael Shanker. So where is that Rudolph Shanker? Which one? My, Michael. Rudolph. I, Rudolph. Rudy. Rudolph. I, I, yeah, I, I get him mixed up. I mean, Scorpions, UFO, <laughs> the whole thing. Maury Brown is here. He is Bizball Maury, uh, our defending champion. I hope I give you the right introduction. I mean, everywhere else is like, he's sports business guy from Portland. He's important. Hey, Maury, tell me. They, they don't talk rock and roll with you in other places. I've seen these other interviews you do. No, man, you're the only one. Well, I mean, you That's got. I we, love you. We got a rock and roll heart. I mean, I I should let my hair out for you, but this is pleasure in the back. It's business in the front right now, and the business of baseball. And we're right in the middle of it, right? Like I had Todd Radom on this week talking about those hideous jerseys at the All Star game. I got you <laughs> on. We're going to talk trading deadline. The Orioles are in the middle of. All of it. I mean, literally, including the regional sports network stuff you were reporting on last week. The Orioles, starting pitcher, starting catcher, all-star shortstop, blah, 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 blah. They're 101 wins, first plays. They're going to get their own all-star game. All this stuff's going on, but they also have the stacked, stacked minor league system. It's an exciting time around here, Maury. Beats the hell out of what we were talking about in Portland six years ago, and then in last place, man. Yeah, I mean uh... – you know, kudos to how they've drafted, um, how they've developed, um, and they've finally figured it out. I mean, Nestor, you and I have been talking about this for what? You know, decade. five, six. Yeah, a decade. A long time. And so we always, always said that Baltimore deserved a winning product. And I never believed for a split second that the Orioles were ever going to leave Baltimore. I know there was some talk about it, but I never believed in it. And now you can see why that would have been such a foolhardy thing. So, yeah, I think that it's important to stress that um, it's important to have teams that have languished for a period of time to resurface. I spoke, this has been, geez, right after Manfred took over as commissioner, I asked him what he wanted to see in terms of teams cycling up and down. And this was in response to what the Astros had done, right? Which was new owner came in and completely blew it up. But it did pertain to the Orioles, which was he saw that or thought that clubs should be in a five-year cycle. He understood that you could not keep windows of competitiveness sustained for long periods. There's just not every club has the resources to do it. Um, and it's probably not healthy for the game. You want to have parity, right? So, well, that was um, what the Baltimore, draft was this designed to do in every sport, right? Is to make the yeah. bad teams better and to penalize the good teams with less talent. That, But that's on a level playing field where everybody has the same amount of money. Baseball is still really the screwed up one out of all of them, really. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it's a it's a problem. And this regional sports network thing that we have going on right now, I think, has got the capacity to, again, really, really separate the top from the bottom. I mean, they're just big outliers. The A's are, are always going to be an example of that. Um, at the top, the Dodgers are the other one. They're the extreme outliers. 
but you're starting to see more and more teams hover around the middle court, you know, or, or the top quartile. And that I think is important, you know, because you don't necessarily have to have the highest payroll probably helps to be somewhere in the top, maybe third. And that gives you a better shot. Mari Brand is our guest. Uh, I should tell everybody how I met you because your original foray into the world of sports media was trying to, and I speak of Baltimore positive, you were um, amongst the group of people that was really trying to bang pots and pans to get a Major League Baseball team in Portland, correct? Yeah, I mean, to clarify it, Nestor, it, it really worked like this. I got tired of driving three and a half hours to go watch Major League Baseball. I still do. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm part of the Baseball Writers Association. If, you know, God willing, next year it's my 10th year, I get a Hall of Fame vote. But it's very, very difficult to get in a car and drive that far and try and cover with any sense of regularity. I wind up traveling to other teams almost as easy as it is to get there. So, yeah, I mean, when the Expos came up, we said, you know, let's just take a look at the market and make a play for it. It will allow us to do a good market analysis and and see where we're at and see if it can be done. And I look at what's been going on around certainly the A's. And I think with expansion, you're going to see a lot of markets that may not necessarily have a good chance at it, but it does provide an opportunity to do a good market analysis. And I think that that's valuable. And that's what we did. Um, of course, we didn't get the team. Of course, they wound up going to Washington, D.C. and becoming the Nationals. Um, but that did give me a, a huge amount of research data around it. And I just started writing about it. And next thing you know, people are asking me to do essays and books. And, you know, over 20 years later, here we are. Yeah. And the only team that really moved was was the Expos to Washington against everyone's will. I mean, I came, look, I was nationally syndicated back in the days when contraction was the thing. I had Jesse, the governing body Ventura of Minnesota on my national show several times screaming that Bud Selig was not going to contract the Minnesota twins. Um, And this Oakland thing's just been festering way longer than I've known you. Maybe I, I decided to wear the Kelly green today to honor the legacy of the Sacramento, Las Vegas, Kansas city, Philadelphia athletics. What do you think? Yeah. I to back to the twins. I mean, people forget that when, when Carl Polad hitched his wagon to that idea of contracting the twins so that it would balance the league out. And there was a huge scream that went up from, their network partners that sued and everybody else there was there there would have been a real problem with it the players association you're going to take 50 jobs away that's a whole different game yeah and the the, the owners never won one of those battles ever no and it's so of course and of course bud's going to say this but i think it's been about five years ago i interviewed bud selig and i asked him about that if that was really really going to happen and it's he of course he, he immediately threw all the other owners under the bus. He says, well, I was doing the will of the owners was the response. Which, yeah, you know, two thirds of them are dead now. Can't speak for themselves. Yeah, so what and he's, to me, right? You know, and he's no longer in the chair. So like he was pretty safe making that comment. I always found it but, better to talk to Faye Vincent than Bud Selig. If you really wanted honesty, you know, in general. If Faye's, you know, I think the most, the wildest interview I ever did was with Faye. Right. He had just had some surgery and was on Vicodin. He admitted this. He was on painkillers and absolutely went wild on Jerry Reinsdorf and Bud Selig and the system. And he's largely been that. I mean, he likes to call himself the last commissioner. He was the last guy that bucked the trend and went against the owners and he got fired for it. So best yeah, interest idea, of the game's not a real thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that people often forget is the commissioner is not as powerful, I think, as people think. The owners have all the power in that thing, and you are constantly at you're, – you're working for the owners, so you're never going to try and go up against them. So for somebody to go up against them in labor, you know, he did exactly the opposite of what the, the owners wanted him to do, and – Um, they, the very famous thing, the Kohler meetings were a disaster. I mean, it was just everything that could go wrong went wrong at that period. 
And of course he was ousted and then Bud came in as an acting commissioner and said he'd never want the position full time, which of course he took. So, I mean, it's, that's an interesting time, Nestor. I mean, it's a critical moment in baseball's history because from that point on, you really see the owners in lockstep. And since then, they've gotten a leg up on the uh, uh, the players with the exception of this last labor deal. I mean, and we had to go into a lockout, and I'm pretty sure we're going to see another one when this labor deal expires. Well, I mean, it, it's fascinating, Mari, and I, we can take a deep dive into this. And I, I, I honestly invited you on to talk some trading deadline stuff, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but when I get deep dive guys on like you, uh, and I start talking about my history and doing this for 33 years. And my introduction was we lost our football team. Uh, are we ever going to get one back? Uh, should, let's not lose our baseball team. Oh, the guy's from DC and might move it there. Oh, he's in failing health. Oh, he's selling it to this creepy dude from Boston, New York guy. That's like a Red Sox fan, like weird. And then Peter gets it and we have a new stadium. And I mean, I've watched all of this. I've watched Masson be born and die. I've watched Peter come in and die. I've, I mean, I've seen it all, but underneath of all of it, it's way beyond the trading deadline and players. There's a, a level of understanding about where this money's going and how all this money comes together that funds all of it. And if you don't understand the business of baseball, it's very, very hard to have a lucid conversation with, I mean, as a guy that took phone calls for 25 years around here, it's, it, there's a wide swath of education gap, kind of like our voting populace as well, which we could get into that in Oregon as well. Um, but I would say for the, for, for people that really care to know about all of this, this trading deadline thing is all about economics, right? Like giving up a player you have control over that you don't have to pay, keeping, you know, in line, seeing the Tampa Bay model, seeing the St. Louis model, seeing other models, seeing the Phillies model. And all of these models are built on way beyond gate revenues and way beyond how much a beer is and what they're even getting in their club suites. It was all always tied well the, the the club seats were the thing 30 years ago but after that it was all media revenue once yes network and nesson stepped in that's how peter was going to keep the orioles competitive i have him on tape saying all this stuff right it was all a lie it was all a ruse his kid got a billion eight out of it and now mr rubenstein comes in and what he's finding right now is this pure potentiality to build the brand of the orioles but this upside down model of Cable television, my stadium, there is no D.C. market anymore. That's gone. Not only is it gone, we have to compete with it. Uh, Philadelphia's up the road. All the problems the Ravens inherited and all the reasons that the lords of the NFL didn't want to put a team here because it was sort of squashed in. The Orioles have this cool brand and this cool thing, but finding the money here, Mari, and I will continue to go back to you as Bisball Mari, all of the excuses that Dick Cass ever laid out to me before he threw me out about not being in the upper quartile of this and not having Fortune 500 companies, all of those issues that were inherent with a small market NFL team that never affected their ability to sign Lamar Jackson or Ray Lewis or any player ever because of the system, the original sin in the garden of Steinbrenner and Reinsdorf when I came on the radio during the strike of, you know, 92, 3, 4, in that era when things were great here and bad everywhere in the sport, the, the original sin of big market, small market, and then there's the trading deadline this week where everything that will happen, all the pieces of money and players and the value of Rutschman and Henderson and Holiday and Westberg and these young players they have against whether they're going to be a $100 million dollar. 130 million, 180 million, whether Grandpa Rubenstein's going to act like the guy in San Diego who just passed away and just said, I'm all in. The way the Tigers were like, I'm all in. It's a civic duty. It's a philanthropy. It is what it is. I'll get my money when I cash it out and sell for three trillion. But we're at that. This is a really interesting week. And that's why I'm reaching to you and the smartest people I know to say, we're going to learn a little bit about Mr. Rubenstein's hand this week, I would think, as well as the future for Mike Elias and what the organization is going to be, because the Orioles are in the center of all of this this week for the first time really ever. Yeah, I would think that they might shore up a piece or two. I mean, it's not like they're in a bad position right now. Um, I think that they they are in in fairly good shape. 
Um, it's it. What's changed, Nestor, is um, the addition of two other wild card teams in each league, right? So we have now six wild card teams. That really altered the buyers and sellers market quite a bit. Because there really is that feeling that a twist here or there and we can be competitive. So let's not mortgage our future um, to try and do something. There are some teams that are obviously clearly out of it. I mean, let's make no mistake about it. No matter what happens with this season, the A's are not going anywhere. They really aren't. The Angels aren't going anywhere. The Blue Jays are not going anywhere. And so I think that you're going to, the Cubs, I think, are another team that have suddenly made it very clear that they're going to be sellers. So the market has really been pretty frozen up. There are a lot of people interested in pieces. So what are those pieces that you're looking for? Well, I'm going to look at a team that I know really well, which is the Seattle Mariners, which is maybe the most schizophrenic team I've seen in a long time in the sense, and I, you know, not to disparage them in that way, but it's that idea that, they are a pitching juggernaut. They are absolutely a team that is running ramshot in terms of pitching and are absolutely abysmal at the plate. They struck out 14 times last night. Now, on the pitching side, they gave the game away in the ninth. So they've got pitching assets. They have more players in the top 100 by Baseball America's prospect outline than any other club. So they have pieces to move. Good. And they, they want Kowser, Kerstad. Who do they want? Uh, Mayo. Who do they want from us? Yeah, I. You know, I don't. In terms of who they're going to move, that is the. I think the ultimate question. I think that what what you're going to start to see, again, are what are teams looking for? And if I was if I was Baltimore, controllable right talent, here, right? I mean, if the yeah, Orioles are going to deal in for pitching, they better get somebody that's going to be here on opening day next year because I don't think they're going to pay Burns. Right. No, and, the, I, and Ortiz is already like onto his thing in Milwaukee. And that's the cost. He wasn't going to play here anyway. I mean, they can't get Norby on the field. They can't get holiday on the field. They can't get Mayo up here. Um, you know, cows are cursed at Stowers, all sort of share it bats. They're, they're a little schizophrenic to your point on what they want to do with Hayes and Mullins and, and maybe even Mountcastle before it's all over with. And all these guys are hot and cold, you know, these hitters and pitching. The Orioles are getting by with, what they have, but what they had was Means and Wells and Bradish and all these guys with the Tommy John thing. So taking a gander on Scooble, it sounds great, but I'm 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 afraid of what happened to the Strasburgs of the world, right? And what I just saw uh, Bradish go through here. Yeah, I mean that is the other component to this thing. I get a lot of this conversation about you know Nolan Ryan and Bob Gibson, and you know you go and pick your flavor of old school guys, and why can't these guys pitch? And they're just not you know as strong and as virile as they used to be. And I I don't think it's fair to compare eras in this sense because right now pitchers are pitching with everything they have as hard as we've ever seen with spin. And that is putting a lot of stress on there. I haven't looked at the numbers, but I'm, it's always staggering to see the dollar amounts that are on the IL for pitchers. And that is the component, right? So, okay, we're looking good now, but that doesn't mean that injury can't come. It's not that it means an injury can't hit anybody in any Dude, position. these guys will bake this up and turn them into running backs, right? Literally. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it 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 is, I think it is important to – Note that there is that, are we second guessing ourselves? Are we in good enough shape? How are we doing? You're talking to everybody in your medical staffs and how it's going. Pitching is always a premium. I mean, you can say that pitching wins baseball, right? But you need hitting and hitting doesn't seem to be a problem for the Orioles. It is, again, things go up and down, right? I mean, you what you're trying to do is keep your losing streaks and everybody goes through them to some kind of manageable level and not crater. And I, I just, I'm really bullish on the Orioles. I think that they are in a pretty good position. So I think you're looking at insurance at this point, Nestor, and how much you're going to go ahead and, and run away with and get rid of is the largely the open question. And, and I, again, I think that what could happen here is, I think the, the market, first of all, the trade market is fairly thin all the way around. And so I think that what's going to happen is there are going to be some teams that are 
pretty desperate. And are the Orioles that desperate to move to go ahead and basically mortgage some of their future? And I don't know why you would do that right now. I really don't. I mean, everybody needs pieces. Look, there's not a team out there. There's no team. The Phillies, I don't care what that team is right now. There's no team that is safe. Everybody is looking for some form of insurance. But I, I'm just, I look across the market right now, and it's just been really a questionable thing. I look, I the Blue Jays, are I think, are an interesting example of this. So they've got another year. They've got another year for both Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. They haven't signed extensions yet. And Bo Bichette is certainly out of the two of them doing the worst out of the pair of them. It's not that Vlad Jr. has done anything really spectacular. He's not looking like he was a couple seasons ago. But he started to see a bit of an upswing. He's obviously in the All-Star game and, and whatnot. So... I don't think, you know, Atkins said that they're not going to move those guys because they have them under club control. And that is a core component, right? Like, what do we have under club control? Do we need to move them now? If we don't, well, maybe we can work something out between now and when we get to where we need to, you know, either cross that bridge or jump off of it. And I think that, again, club control becomes such a critical piece. You are You know exactly what you're going to get. And in and coming back to the to the RSN model, one of the things that drives owners and G and of course that funnels down to the GMs crazy is the numbers that they get from their CFOs, which is I need cost certainty. What are our revenues? How are our revenues going to look next year, next week? How are things looking so that I can make a decision on wrapping up players if I get a if I get a rental. Am I going to be able to sign them to an extension or do I just get them as a rental and hope that that are the piece to make us move? And that is becoming a harder and harder decision based upon the fact that we've got a, a the majority of the regional sports networks up in the air with Diamond Sports Group, with the controls all the Bally Sports Networks. Everybody's up in the air. Rob Manfred has said that they want to bring all of those under a, a unified model they want to go to something similar to what the nfl has they'll never get all 30 clubs because the yankees because maybe the orioles be, certainly because of the dodgers and the red sox so it becomes this very difficult well the model orioles are still which, under dispute i mean peter's dead they and they still don't have a deal with the nationals literally right right so. and but and I, I i hold to them because there's there's capacity right i mean there is the dispute it is going to continue to go on but I do look at these things where you sit there and you go, is there capacity to make something happen? If I look at the brands, I can go, well, in the market, there's something there. The Astros are another one. You're never going to get but, all but, of but, them. But, but Mari, this then goes back to what the financial model is in 2028 or 2029 when they're mm -hmm. going to have to pay Gunnar Henderson 50 million a year mm -hmm. and Rutschman 30 if they you know if they're going to have these and yeah. if holidays on, add him into that mix, right? He's supposed to be that special guy, right? So all that being said. Your cost certainty in 2028 or 2029, I know one way they're not getting money from me. They're not going to get cable television anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be bundled in. It's not going to mm -hmm. be $3.50 a sub from six different states and all of the things that the Angelos family drank off of, negotiated for when they got Masson two decades ago. I don't know that they know what the model mm -hmm. is. And when I bring the smartest people on, and I would put you at least in that upper 1% of that, um, tip your cap for that, Maury. And by the way, is that Ken Griffey on your hat? Is that, is that Griffey? It's Griffey, baby. It's, it's, I, was, I can't get it. It's, it's a little fuzzy, but it's Griffey. Um, it's, is that off of Pennington? Or, you know, I'm trying to look there and see that. Now, he's not wearing that not wearing that green jersey and that thing. But nonetheless. No, it's, it's – if you can see on the side, where is it at? Oh, it's got the – Nintendo controller. It's the eight bit oh. Griffey. Hey, I'm plugging baseballism today. Well, that's why it's a little out of focus. So I'm fine. Okay. I yeah. thought I'm not, I didn't drink that much at Van Hagar the other night that I, <laughs> I can't see what's going on here. Um, But I, I guess, you know, back to the heart of it. My question is always where the, where's the money coming from? Is it coming from fans in middle river at $10 a throw? They're doing a thing in August and September, Mari. And it, listen, 
they do a lot of things to try to get people to the ballpark, right? Joe mm-hmm. and Jet, they got a splash zone, the owner dances in the seventh. Day. They're doing all of this. They're going to spend $600 million of our dollars on their house to do whatever they want, to charge us more, to come into the perimeter, and like all the same thing the Ravens are doing. But my question is, is the, the revenue model and the business model, it used to be 30 years ago when I came on the radio, it was ticket sales, attendance, beer sold, how many people come out for a floppy at night, whatever. I don't know that that's moving the needle at all to afford Adley Rutschman's shoes if he's $40 million a year. And because I've done the math on all of that and what it costs them to open the stadium and do all that, they have all of this ancillary media revenue that they think can come from website. BAM has been a very successful thing over the last 15 years that you can speak to. But I keep thinking that there's going to be this sort of this country club, this access point where for $500 a year or $2,000 a year, I get X amount of seats, X amount of merch, X amount of this, and the games. And the games anywhere I want them, because at the end of the day, when they start doing crazy shit, like... Apple television and all of this stuff that if my mother were still alive and she's gone, she would be 105 if she was still here now. But she loved baseball. And at the end of her life, Mass and One, Mass and Two, is the game on? Is it on Fox Sports? Is it just having it where it comes to you to some degree? Because the young people aren't like us, Maury. They're not going to go chase this down, and it's not going to come on Channel 364 on your cable television anymore. They really are going to have to, in a lacrosse market and where I am, really chase people to get their credit card and, and in a way that is honorable, where people feel like, I want to give you money, be a member of the Orange Club, but what do I get for that? Because I think this, the way we think of cable television we got to stop doing that, Mari, because it's not going to work like that. It can't work like that and still afford Adley Rutschman. Otherwise, how much am I going to have to pay? Ten dollars a game for it's going to be fifteen hundred dollars a year. To have, nobody's going to do that. So I, I don't, I don't know where their cost point is, but I do know I'm from Dundalk. I grew up hard Scrabble. My dad was senior citizen tickets and all that. I do know there's a real disconnect between the elite side of baseball and what people can afford and what people that love baseball that want to interact with baseball. And they, they're not even giving six bucks up on an Apple TV subscription on Friday night. Cause it's nuts. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're making it hard to be a fan in that way. Business wise. Yeah. I would say that this is, um, we're, this is a crossover point. So we had this thing where people were like, Hey man, just, I just want to have my baseball. I don't care about this other stuff. I don't really want to watch Food Network or whatever it is. You know, just give me my games. Well, then it was careful what you asked for. Everybody started to offer up these, you know, direct-to-consumer offerings via streaming. And suddenly it's become so fragmented and everybody wants to have a paid service, right, that it there's only so much discretionary income to go around. Now, it's interesting. I'm in the middle of a story um, for on a couple of different fronts, strangely for auto racing with Formula E, a recap of their last 10 years. But I'm also looking at Major League Baseball with this Roku deal. And the Roku thing's kind of interesting in the sense that you go, well, yeah, I why? This makes no sense. But what they are is an aggregator. And that's what we really want, right? Hey, man, just tell me where I'm going to find my stuff. I, where are the games at? I need a central location where I can find it. And I don't Marty, I got be- a guy that covers the team for a living that lives across the Pennsylvania line. He can't get the games out of market. And, and, and sometimes it's a Phillies game and his like, it, it's mm-hmm. crazy. And there well, are games he can't watch. Literally, can't, me, you can't get on an app, can't get anywhere. John Angelos was supposed to be in front of this. He was a disgrace. Like, this, these are the basic things that when your team gets really good, you know, you, you got to give me the product, bro. You know what I mean? So, so let's talk about that because I think that's a super important thing in the blackouts. Um, I have been – it's been a cottage industry for me, Nestor, for 20 years somehow some way i think that it finally got through because it's been the number one complaint from fans for those 20 years rob manfred and the owners i think have finally realized that what you really want or what they want is to get unified right put it under one umbrella 
have it be a central thing, the MLB channel, and well, you'll the get example everything. would be Much... WWE, right? Probably, right? Yeah. Well, so or think about uh, so. I want to. I want to talk about something our audience would be familiar with. That you subscribe or you don't. I don't. I never see wrestling anymore. It's like it doesn't exist. Right. It comes once a year in March. We applaud whoever the, the Rock comes back or whatever. But like, it's not in my face anymore. And I have cable TV, but I just don't. Look, I'm not watching the news either with the, the, the political site. Like, I, I just I watch the games, and that's about my extent. I don't even I haven't even watched the Bon Jovi documentary. I know you find it hard to believe, but yeah, well, I haven't watched it either. But then I'm not a big Bon Jovi fan. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, I I, I want to finish this because I think it's important. Sure. Um, the 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 idea, so that idea of I just want to watch the games and I want to have them in a spot. So, um. I, I am going to pick on Apple for a second because Apple picked up all of MLS. So it is in a central location to serve. Baseball would get get it and make it available through MLB.tv. And you could go, oh, I just want to get my team. I don't care about all the other stuff. But what you would eventually get to is this idea where blackouts are completely gone. Now, in baseball's mind – they see the model now when you go direct to consumer as there are no more blackouts. So if I'm watching on TV, you're going, why are you telling me this more? You're being a liar. It's blacked out on my television. Baseball will say, okay, it's blacked out due to our TV deal, but you're not blacked out because you can go and get this streaming deal and watch it there. Granted, there's a cost component to this, right? Okay, whatever. If I want to get around it, then I can do it that way. So, well, throw the black market money. in with the VPNs too. Throw that in. Right. That's, a that's big part the, of it. well. But I, I think that it. What we're seeing here is everybody. The NFL, right? The NFL is the biggest player by far over everybody, and they're jumping on the Amazon train. Everybody is jumping into the streaming thing, trying to get a, their handle on it. Look, we just saw. Dude, this I was in NBA. Korea five years ago, and I couldn't get the NFL. And I and I find that I was in Seoul. I mean, I like a real place, and it was impossible for me to get the game. I was in Japan twenty years ago for nineteen ninety nine. It came into my hotel room. Like you know, it it really does depend on where you are to some degree mm -hmm. as to what you get. But the thing that's blown my mind during this whole era is that the Orioles were supposed to get rich and the Angelos family off of the expertise around the delivery of their television network. It was always mm -hmm. garbage. It was always trash down to Kevin Brown getting hazed last year about all of it. But the worst part is that it's a Friday night. My wife and I want to drive to Ocean City and I just and I pay them. I pay through cable. I pay for mass and masses make I'm paying for the game, but I can't get it on my phone. That, that was the part. And that's going on forever and ever and ever and ever. And it was like, well then listen to the game on the radio. Look, I own a radio station. I don't, I'm glad BAL still in business. You know what I mean? Like it's good, but they're they're The, the notion of this, um, um, you know, e eating off your own arm, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they haven't figured that out. And to your point, you're like, I've been beating on them for 20 years. You have access to the commissioner. They read the internet. They know what the problems are. They, they've not been quick to solve these problems as quickly. I shouldn't say quickly time of game, the Manfred man on second, like all these things, these, did, these happen quickly, but it took them 30 years to get to that point. Pitcher not batting, you know, all of that stuff. It feels like it's glacial, but it really feels um, like a true disconnect when it's the actual access to the game itself. Yeah, I mean, um, so the changes, of course, the rule changes, attendance is up. And and before the Diamond Sports Network, again, the Ballet Sport Net Network um, bankruptcy and Comcast kicking them off, basically, um, the numbers were trending up. That's why regional sports network numbers are going to be all over the place right now. It's very hard to suss stuff out in aggregate. Um, I think the thing well, that there was a feeling that, that live sports was the only thing left that television was going to support 10 years ago. I heard a lot of that. It, and that's why the Sinclair boys all went in and bought these things. Right. Yeah. Well, no. Well, Sinclair went all in, but they they over leveraged themselves. I mean, that was their the, they had made a bad. They paid they more than it was worth. It. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that the, the biggest change, Nestor, everybody saw it coming. They just didn't know when it was going to arrive. And what really threw a wrench into that whole thing was the pandemic. Because what happened was people figured out, you know what? I don't really need to go out and I don't really need to watch sports and I don't need to really have traditional television. 
I want to watch, I'm stuck at home, let me watch movies. And so you saw this, there was already subs peeling away from traditional cable and satellite, and it just massively accelerated. And here we are. It's kind of like, you know, there are people that telework. I don't know if, you know, for those that are out there, there are people that, you know, were in the computer industry and they were able to work from home. And then the pandemic ended and they went, you know what? Why do am I going into the office at all? I'm actually more productive at home. And so the model changed. It really, some people did not slide back into the normalcy of the whole thing. We're just now starting to see ban attendance back to where we were before the pandemic. So it's been a slow ride. But look, I think in five years, this thing has to settle in. You're going to, it's like anything else, Nestor. When something new comes along, there are all these, you know, one-offs that happen. Everybody gets out in there. And then what happens is the big fish start to gobble up the little ones. And they become the true aggregators and the players in that. The bad thing is in that, in that transition phase, everybody's just like, where's my stuff? I just want to watch my stuff. I don't want to pay for it here and have it be gone in a year and a half or two years. Just tell me where it's going to be with some sense of certainty. That is not a known quantity anymore. I mean, I've had discussions around different sports properties and the ability to get a 10-year deal is almost impossible in this day and age. They're much shorter because they're trying to figure out they're playing with players that may not be that big right now. They're hoping for it. You know, like, again, I'll go back to Roku. They've got an arm in because the television you buy off the floor at whatever, wherever you buy it at may come largely with a Roku interface. So they get an automatic audience by simply by osmosis. So again, I think that what happens is, can, is that going to continue to grow? Did anybody see Amazon being as big as it is now? No, of course not. No, stock, right? we didn't. There were other e-commerce things. There were a million e-commerce places. Those places are largely gone. I mean, there is e-commerce that goes on, but Amazon is the big player. And that, again, I think will be what is going to happen in this thing. Sports will always be the prime property because it's live. It's unscripted. It will always be. Oh, there. and you can bet on it, too. I don't know if you heard that lately. That's true. Yeah, don't. Yeah, that. Oh, boy. That's a whole topic we could go. Well, you talk I, about revenue streams. I mean, that's what all these teams are hoping that becomes a larger piece of the pie so that, that they is, can, quite frankly, afford Adley Rutschman. So this is where you you said, you know, where's the money going to come from? And that that is a huge piece. Sponsorship growth and that really – and then obviously how things center on the gaming industry. And the, so the, the, the sports leagues, every dog on one of them, has been involved in an athlete scandal already or a personnel scandal, obviously, with Shohei Otani. And, and to be continued, yes. And and right. probably at some point, probably shoved under the rug in some cases if it's if it's too hot for them. Uh, so, like the NFL will get their, a special commissioner czar to come in to give an oral report when they're – I mean, like the, the, that that's where the scrutiny of journalism is really – gone for all of this is so, to say that, that they are they've set up a dice game and they've adjudicated mm -hmm. who owns the dice who blows mm -hmm. on them and who decides whether that's a seven or whether that's an eight like literally especially when you're doing balls and strikes uh, and fouls and not fouls it's it's really um it, it, it the government will be involved in this before it's all over with mari i promise you we that. so it, this is i've got a uh, you mentioned the writers um, I'm We're 100 on, years out on Shoeless Joe, bro. I know. I'm you on. Know? I'm on. I'm on the committee, the what's called the gambling committee. We just the baseball writers just adopted at the All Star Game, so it's in our constitution. We had to go through and create rules that basically said, "Don't release your awards picks until after the awards have been announced, because it influences the line." writers that are involved with a primary goal of their outlet being about gambling will no longer be allowed. Writers are going to be held to a standard in baseball and God willing, it crosses over to the other ones because if you can have, it's become so embedded now that it's almost quickly, impossible very to get away quickly, out. very it quickly. Is. So we're, you know, I, I kudos to my, you know, 
to the rest of the baseball writers who saw this as something that we had to get out in front of and try and do something about this to try and do whatever was possible to avoid this. That is the problem. That is the biggest problem. And the players are notified. They know about this stuff, but it's like, it's so pervasive and so easy and accessible with your phone now. Well, look what's happened. Well, the Otani family. Yeah. Yeah. And the leagues are not going to walk away from this. There's no way. I mean, there is no way on this earth that they're going to walk away from it because they want to see, of course, the revenues. You're going to look for new revenues and amplify the channels of where those revenues come from, wherever it can be found. And if one is starting to lag off, i.e., you know, the media side of things, then they're going to try and see how they can make it up on the other side in the interim until they until this thing gets sorted out. Mari Brand is here. He is Bizball Mari. You can follow him. Out of Forbes and business of sports and all these sorts of places. Uh, any, do we need to talk any rock and roll? Baseball must be fun again for us because, like, I didn't even get any of your scorpion stuff in here or any of that hair fest. I mean, you're in the middle of like uh, the, the season for rock and rollers like you. Yeah, I played Friday. I almost passed out. I came really close. It was like 97. You got to hydrate, Mario. Come on, hydrate, bro. Come on. You know. Yeah, so that was Friday with the scorpions thing in the heat of the day. And then I played Saturday night. And it was epic as normal. Uh, yeah, I'm in the season. I'm playing Wednesday. Uh, you know, playing the the Washington County Fair. So on the main stage, and a bunch of other stuff coming up. So you know, it's it's the you know this is the the salad days. You know, everything happens really around the summer for festivals, and it's a lot of fun. You know, my brain says I'm still 20. My body is the next day it just doesn't rebound like it used to man i'm just not as clearly not as young as i used to be but it's it's awesome as the stuff behind me shows yeah it, you got it, the rock and roll gear there you yeah, got the guitars going it covers, I, listen i would just say this with you with fraction. the scorpions i can't have scorpions cover guitar player blacks out there's a little scorpion reference there for you black <laughs> hey, so, uh, there he goes I all right what you did there. i rocked you like a hurricane is what i did this place is a zoo uh maury brown taking his holiday out to uh portlandia and i, I keep it safe out there keep it right in portland i'll come out and visit you sometime soon get to the rose garden and uh do a proper pearl jam concert or something like that all right all right, man, you take care of yourself. It's always great to talk to you, Nestor. Always great. We got baseball trading deadline stuff. We have like a legitimate, like a real baseball team here now. Like we got things to talk about. Luke's talking about him. He's out of training camp as well. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore positive.